Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to welcome our, our second panel and, and thank you in advance for your, for your testimony. It is the custom of this committee uh, to ask witnesses to be sworn uh, who are to provide uh, testimony before it. So could I ask you all to rise and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give to this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show that all of the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. In the interest of time, what I'd like to do is just to offer a brief introduction of each of the witnesses, and then we'll go back and, and uh, allow the witnesses to provide an opening statement. Uh, Councilor, Council Member Jim Graham became chairman of the Metro Board in January of 1999. Uh, Mr. Mr. Graham currently serves on the Council of the District of Columbia, representing Ward 1. He also chairs the Council's Committee on Public Works and Transportation. Mr. Graham served as Executive Director of the Whitman Walker Clinic from 1984 to 1998. Previously, Mr. Graham served as Staff Counsel for Senator Abe Ribicoff, Democrat from Connecticut, and Clerk to Chief Justice Earl Warren, now retired. Mr. John B. Cato has more than 30 years of experience in public transportation. As General Manager of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, he oversees the second largest rail transit system and the fifth largest bus network in the United States with more than 10,000 employees, a $1.3 billion operating budget, and a $3.1 billion five-year capital improvements program. Mr. Deborah A.P. Herzman was sworn in as the 35th member of the National Transportation Safety Board on June 21, 2004. Since her appointment to the board, Ms. Herzman has been the member on scene at 15 major transportation accidents. Before joining the NTSB, Ms. Herzman was a senior professional staff member of the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation from 1999 to 2004. Mr. Eric Madison joined the Mass Transit Administration as Transportation Planner in 2007. Mr. Madison was appointed as a district representative to the Tri-State Oversight Committee for State Safety Oversight of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, Metro Rail System, and in April 2007 became chair of the committee. Mr. Madison began his career with the District Department of Transportation in 2003 as an administrative management officer for the Public Space Management Administration. Mr. Peter M. Rogoff was confirmed by the United States Senate as administrator of the Federal Transit Administration in May of 2009. Prior to joining the Federal Transit Authority, Mr. Rogoff served on the staff of the Senate Appropriations Committee for 22 years, including 14 years as the Democratic Staff Director of the Transportation Subcommittee. Mr. Rogoff has a strong background in federal infrastructure, budgeting, and finance, and has played an active role in the financing of the last three comprehensive surface transportation reauthorization bills. I would now like to represent, uh, excuse me, recognize Mr. Graham for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Chavitz, Delegate Norton, Congressman Connolly, and Congressman Van Hollen. I am here today in my capacity as Chairman of the Metro Wilmata Board. Uh, June 22nd, 2009 was and will always be a date of great tragedy for our agency and for all who rely on it. Those most directly impacted remain in our hearts and prayers and motivate our every action. I want to especially thank Mr. Tewitt for coming here today to share his personal experience, which I found very impactful. As a first step, our board did act within 24 hours to authorize the general manager to provide emergency hardship relief funds to those who were victims of this tragedy. That relief was not contingent on anything, and it was made clear that it had no ramifications of, of a legal nature insofar as ultimate liability. It was rather a humanitarian gesture to relieve immediate hardship and I know firsthand from working with certain of these families that it was really very much appreciated. On behalf of our board of directors, I want to say that we believe in our management and we have confidence in the skill and dedication of our general manager, John Cato. 
We believe our system is safe, and we will do all we can to ensure that once the probable cause or causes of the accident are identified, action will be taken by the authority to remedy and address those problems. Please keep in mind that in all of our history, there has been but one other fatality involving passengers, and that was more than 25 years ago. But for pressing infrastructure needs, we need, but for pressing infrastructure needs, we need real action by the Congress to make good on the promise in last year's Authorization Act and thereby provide a full payment of $150 million in FY10 federal appropriations. Presently, our local jurisdictions carry nearly the entire burden. For example, D.C. taxpayers will send some $300 million to Metro WMATA in FY10. We are very encouraged, Mr. Chairman, by the action that was taken yesterday by the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Transportation uh, to take that first and extraordinarily important step in, in appropriating $150 million for FY10. I want to commend everyone that was involved in this, most particularly our regional delegation. Some of the members are here today, uh, Delegate Norton, Congressman Connolly, Congressman Van Hollen, and others. And I also want to single out uh, our majority leader, uh, Mr. Hoyer, for his fine role in all of this. Um, I believe that if Congress acts to finalize the $150 million for FY10, that D.C., Maryland, and the Commonwealth of Virginia will all find the matching funds to bring together $300 million uh, annually for each of the next 10 years. This money will make a critical difference in our abilities. Mr. Chairman, I remember our last hearing where you were so diligent in terms of making sure that we had put everything out of the path in terms of obstacles in order to make sure that this money would become available. But, Mr. Chairman, we also need to have the active commitment of President Barack Obama and his administration to find emergency stimulus dollars for immediate assistance with these infrastructure issues. I noted that Congressman Davis made a particular point of this in his comments today. Finally, we appreciate the support of our local congressional delegation, as I have said, in its continued to work to move all of this forward. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Cato, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, also Ranking Member Chavitz. I am happy to be here today to testify in front of you in the position of General Manager of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. Um, commonly known as Romata or Metro. The basic facts of what happened on June 22nd are really described in my written testimony, as well as the testimony from the National Transportation Safety Board. And through this questioning um, this afternoon, I'm sure we will cover every aspect of that. I do want to say that we are working with the National Transportation Safety Board to provide support in their investigation and they have the lead responsibility for the investigation of this accident. Today I will focus on the steps that Metro has taken since the accident to ensure the safety of our riders and employees and also touch on the capital needs of this organization. First, I would like to extend my sympathy and those of all Metro employees to the families of those who died in this accident. I, as well as all Metro employees, are saddened by this event, and, but my grief is only small compared to the grief of the families of those who lost their lives. Our thoughts are also with those who are injured, and we pray for their speedy recovery. This is a difficult time for them and their loved ones, and we would do whatever we can to help them um, come through this process. I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank the first responders from the District of Columbia, as well as from other local fire departments, police departments, as well as members of the Metro Transit Police and our employees who responded to this accident and provided assistance in a very quick, uh, in my judgment, time period. My written testimony also includes the list of those who provided assistance, which I am truly, deeply grateful. 
Safety is at the foundation of what we do at Metro. We have always taken our responsibility to safety seriously, and we have always taken a number of steps to ensure that this system is as safe as possible. First, upon notice um, of this accident, um, we began to operate all of our trains in manual mode rather than automated mode um, to ensure, again, the integrity of the system. Second, within days of discovering that a track circuit in the area of the accident had lost its ability from time to time to detect trains, we physically inspected each of the 3,000 track circuits in our rail system. And, and we are also running daily computerized tests on those circuits. Third, we have arranged for an independent review of our automated trans train control system um, after uh, and working with the National Transportation Safety Board. Um, this review will be conducted by a group of outside transit signal experts. And I appreciate the assistance um, provided by the American Public Transportation Association for assistance in this effort. Finally, while they are safe to operate, I decided to place our oldest rail cars in the center of trains. We plan to replace those cars as soon as funding is available and funding is secured. As you may be aware, yesterday the National Transportation Safety Board recommended that Metro enhance redundancy in our train control system by using real-time data and automatic alerts. We have already begun contacting vendors with experts or expertise in this area. And we are preparing an estimate of the cost to develop and implement the automated system. When we are able to determine the steps necessary, we will move forward with this system. We will do what we have to to ensure that this system is put into place. However, it requires a specialized development for the Ramada system. But we would dedicate the necessary resources to implement this recommendation as soon as that system is ready. This meeting and this process will not begin next week. It has already begun. And in fact, a meeting is scheduled tomorrow morning with the vendors um, within Ramada to begin the process of moving forward to meet the recommendations by the National Transportation Safety Board. We also recognize and I realize that this is an inconvenience to many of our customers of operating our system the way we're doing so today. We have not been able to return to pre-accident levels of service and we will not be able to do so until this best investigation is completed. Finally, I'd like to thank um, the subcommittee uh, on appropriations for including the $150 million in funding for Metro's capital needs. Our capital needs over the next 10 years total $11.4 million, $4 billion. And what I'm asking that this committee and the Congress do is to pass the compact amendments necessary to uh, make the changes in our compact and to also uh, appropriate the one point, um, one, one point, $150 million um, and pass it through the House so we can receive those funds for needed capital improvements. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Ms. Herzman, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you for the invitation to appear before the committee, Mr. Lynch, Mr. Chaffetz, uh, and members of the uh, regional delegation. Uh, Ms. Norton has been a long uh, supporter of the NTSB's investigations, and uh, Mr. Van Hollen and Mr. Connolly, who's my representative, uh, have been very engaged on this uh, accident investigation. Since 1982, the NTSB has investigated seven accidents on WMATA's property, resulting in 76, in 76 recommendations on a variety of issues. I am here today to brief you on the accident that occurred on June 22, involving two red line trains traveling inbound near the Fort Totten station. There were nine fatalities and scores of injuries transported to local area hospitals. On behalf of the board, I would like to extend our thoughts and prayers to those who lost loved ones and those who remain uh, in recovery uh, from this accident. We launched our team within hours of the collision, 
parties to our investigation and involve um, many of the people that you see at this table, WMATA, FTA, Amalgamated Trans and Union that was at the table before, and the Tri-State Oversight Committee. We were also assisted, as is customary in our accident investigations, by the FBI's evidence response team documenting evidence on scene, as well as in the early stages of the investigation by many local responders uh, from the area who did a great job assisting us. Let me begin by reviewing some factual information about our investigation. The standing train, train 214, was a six-car train consisting of four 3,000 series cars and two 5,000 series cars placed at the rear of that train. It had stopped before entering the Fort Totten station. It was following a train that was servicing the platform at Fort Totten. The striking train, train 112, was a six-car train composed of six 1,000 series cars, and it was following train 214. As you heard um, from the eyewitness to the accident, uh, when we interviewed passengers after the accident, they told us that there was an announcement that they came on board, that there was a train stopped ahead of them. They slowed or stopped, and then they began accelerating, and then the collision occurred. There was no communication between the train operators and Metro's operations control center prior to the collision. Metro's, Metro's rail cars are approximately 75 feet long. That lead car of the striking train telescoped into this last car of the standing train. Approximately 50 feet of that car's survivable space, or two-thirds of that car's survivable space, was compromised in the collision. Our investigators found metal-to-metal -metal compression marks consistent with heavy braking on both rails of the track for about 125 feet, about 425 feet before the point of impact. Trains operate under the direction of WMATA's Operations Control Center, or OCC. They utilize an automatic train control system that's supplemented by wayside signals at interlockings. The system is designed to prevent collisions, regardless of whether or not trains are operating in the manual or the automatic mode. Speed commands for individual train movements should not allow for more than one train to occupy a track circuit at a time, and the maximum authorized speed for this section of track was 59 miles per hour. Post-accident testing shows that the track circuit at the accident site intermittently failed to detect a train that was at that location. On the day of the accident, the tr system did not detect the stop train, and the following train did not receive speed commands to slow or to stop prior to the collision. WMATA's maintenance records showed that on, on June 17th, five days before the accident, that an impedance bond pictured in the uh, slideshow uh, was replaced uh, in the track circuit as part of a multi-year uh, program for uh, scheduled maintenance. Investigators are continuing to examine the train control system circuitry and recorded data to better understand how the train control system functioned prior to the accident. In addition, we will be conducting, with the assistance of WMATA, some site distance tests on that stretch of track between Tacoma and Fort Totten this weekend. The Operations Control, Com control Center computer system receives real-time train location data. It displays this information on a monitor in the control center. A after a post-accident review of the circuit data, WMATA reported that the track circuit intermittently lost its ability to detect a train after June, after June 17th. WMATA has now assigned personnel to review recorded data once a day to identify anomalies system-wide. They do not have an automatic monitoring system that would identify and promptly report a situation in which a train stops being detected by the system. That is why we issued two urgent safety recommendations yesterday, one to WMATA and one to FTA. The recommendation to WMATA asks that it enhance the safety redundancy of its train control system that monitors track circuit data so that it can detect any lost trains and immediately alert the control center so that they can stop or slow the trains. The safety recommendation to FDA urges it to alert other transit operators that have systems similar to Metro's to determine if their systems have adequate safety redundancies, and if they don't, to take corrective action. Thank you for inviting me here today. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Rogoff, you now recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Chaffetz, and other members of the subcommittee. The Federal Transit Administration appreciates very much being called to testify on the overall safety posture of our nation's rail transit systems and the FTA's very limited role in overseeing rail transit safety. As we address this issue of transit safety, it is essential to remember that rail transit remains our safest form of surface transportation by far. The citizens of the Washington area are, are always far safer riding in a metro rail car, any type of metro car, than traveling on the highway. The metro rail system has experienced 13 onboard crash-related fatalities during its 33-year history. While every one of those fatalities has been a tragedy, the fact is that automobile accidents on the roads of the Washington area claim the same number of fatalities every two weeks. Any proposal that could result in passengers getting in their cars versus riding metro will immediately degrade safety. That said, the Obama administration believes that there are improvements and reforms that can and should be made to make our transit systems even safer. While it is not very widely known, right now our nation's rail transit systems operate under two very different federal safety regimes. Commuter rail systems like MARC and the VRE are subject to the Federal Railroad Administration's very extensive safety regulations. Those rail transit systems are governed by national mandatory safety standards, and they undergo on-site spot inspections and audits by federal inspectors. Those federal safety inspectors are empowered to dictate operating practices and assess fines for any deficiencies found. By contrast, rail transit systems like Washington Metro, the New York City subway, the trolley operations on the T in Boston, and 45 other systems are subject to a very different federal safety regime. In the case of those rail transit systems, the states are expected to establish and implement a safety program. The role of the Federal Transit Administration is limited to setting minimum program requirements and ensuring that the states have a safety authority in place. In performing our safety oversight role, the FDA is prohibited as a matter of federal law from dictating safety practices or setting mandatory national standards. FDA does not have the authority to assess fines, set operating rules, or even mandate the level of technical expertise the state authorities must have. And unfor unfortunately, the vast majority of these state agencies, including the tri-state authority that oversees mes Metro, are very thinly staffed. The distinction between these two safety systems was plainly apparent at the site of the recent red line crash. Uh, when I visited the crash site at the uh, invitation of Member Herzman, I saw a chain link fence that separated the Metro tracks from other tracks in the same corridor that served Amtrak, Mark, and CSX trains. Under our two separate safety systems, the federal inspector that periodically inspects the track serving Amtrak and Mark cannot inspect the track on the other side of the fence, the side serving Metro. As the new team has come on board with the Obama administration, we find this status quo to be unacceptable and we expect to propose reforms. Secretary LaHood has established a multimodal departmental committee chaired by Deputy Secretary Porcari to identify alternative approaches to address what we consider a gap in transit safety oversight. The team will review the different safety authorities and inspection regimes we have at DOT with an eye toward proposing reforms to Congress soon. Now, on the matter of financing, it is impossible to discuss the issue of safety of our nation's transit systems without simultaneously discussing the financing of those systems. At the FTA, we find that the systems that are adequately financed are those with a dedicated funding source that provides a predictable revenue stream, and WMATA does not have such a system. WMATA does benefit from a regular stream of federal formula grants that totaled approximately $220 million in 2008. Also, WMATA operates in the only region in the United States where the federal government has mandated transit benefits for all federal employees. That generates an additional $170 million each year in fare box revenue for WMATA. In addition to these federal resources, the Secretary and I do support congressional efforts to make matching federal grants available to WMATA for 2010 while working within the overall spending ceiling established in the President's annual budget. We believe strongly, however, that these federal matching funds must be used by WMATA to address the most safety critical issues in the system as identified by appropriate vulnerability assessments. I want to make clear that in calling for reform and endorsing additional funding for WMATA, I do not intend to leave the impression that the cause of the recent red line disaster was related to inadequate safety rules, inadequate safety oversight, inadequate funding, or poor compliance on the part of Metro. Only the NTSB will investigate only that the NTSB investigation will reveal to us the true cause or causes of the accident, 
and we at the FTA stand ready to review and implement any recommendations that arise from the board's investigation just as we did yesterday evening while working within the very limited safety authorities we have under current law. Uh, now, Mr. Chairman, my time is up. I, I hope I will have an opportunity later to respond to the concerns raised by Mr. Micah regarding our grant rules, and maybe we can do that in Q&A. And with that, I thank you for your, uh, the opportunity to testify. I thank, I thank the gentleman. Mr. Madison, you are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, distinguished members of the committee, good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to discuss rail operations and safety at the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, or WMATA, and the tragic accident of June 22, 2009, as well as the activities of the Tri-State Oversight Committee, which we call the TOC. Before I begin, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the members of the TOC to express our heartfelt sympathies and condolences to the victims and the families of those who are affected by this tragic accident. We will continue to keep them in our thoughts and prayers. The members of the talk are fully committed to working closely with WMATA, the Federal Transit Administration, the NTSB, and Congress to improve safety operations and prevent another similar accident from ever occurring again. My testimony will provide a brief overview of the State Safety Oversight Program in general as prescribed by 49 Code of Federal Regulations Part 659 and the TOC's roles, responsibilities, and authority. I will also discuss the TOC's recent history and address the limitations faced by the TOC in performing safety oversight and regulation of WMATA. The TOC is the State Safety Oversight Agency, or SSO, responsible for overseeing Metro's rail safety program. Under 49 CFR Part 659, each state with a rail transit agency, like the metro system, that receives FTA funding and is not under the jurisdiction of the Federal Railroad Administration must designate a state agency to carry out the SSO requirements. The TOC is a joint effort of staff from state government agencies from the District of Columbia, Virginia, and Maryland. State safety oversight agencies approve a transit agency's safety and security plans, review accident reports and corrective action plans, and conduct periodic safety audits, among other tasks. Unlike some transportation regulators like the FAA and the FRA, the TOC lacks the authority to levy fines or enforce civil penalties for noncompliance. In 2006, the Government Accountability Office conducted an assessment of the SSO program on a national level, including a case study on multi-state SSOs, including the TOC. The GAO report made note of administrative, financial, and organizational issues facing the TOC, to which we have responded by streamlining our organization, further empowering the TOC chair, and improving our working relationship with WMATA. In addition to the GAO report, the Federal Transit Administration audited the TOC program in 2007. The audit resulted in eight findings of noncompliance and four findings of compliance with recommendations. Working with WMATA, TOC was able to close all but two findings of noncompliance and one finding of compliance with a recommendation. The TOC is in the process of, of preparing its next audit response submission to the FTA and expects to satisfy the three remaining audit findings in the near future. While the administration of the TOC program has improved, significant challenges remain. These include the lack of a traditional regulatory structure and continued funding constraints. The TOC has limited regulatory authority under 49 CFR Part 659. The only authority inherent to 659 is the ability of the SSO to recommend to the FTA to withhold 5% of grant funding if the rail transit agency is noncompliant. Compliance with the SSO program is a requirement of, for FTA funding. However, SSO agencies themselves receive no FTA funds for program administration. Despite its limitations, state safety oversight programs nationwide have improved and expanded in the last few years. For example, the FTA now funds some training through the Transportation Safety Institute, as well as hosting workshops for SSO managers. Such courses have developed, helped develop to improve the program overall and should be continued. The talk is professionally and personally invested in the safety and security of the Metro Rail system. Our members, as well as their friends and loved ones, are regular Metro Rail riders. We hope our testimony can assist Congress with assessing and improving the SSO program and in turn improve rail transit safety nationally. With that, I conclude my statement and look forward to your questions. I thank the gentleman. I now yield myself uh, five minutes. Uh, 
we obviously have some votes pending, but what I'd like to do is to keep the hearing going so that we're not here at an unreasonably late hour. Uh, Mr. Graham, uh, in trying to follow the budgetary priorities for the uh, Washington uh, Metro Area Transportation Authority, uh, I know that uh, the Administration and Oversight Committee just preliminarily approved a $177 million system infrastructure and rehab program. And, and trying to follow those items, uh, it appears, and, and I may be wrong, so I, I, I'm, I'm not uh, opposed to being corrected on this. Uh, it looks like the project includes new escalators, uh, platform rehab, all, all, all very important things, uh, track repairs, upgrades to the train power system, and uh, most relevant here, the automatic train controls. But I could not find <coughs> any, any allocation, and it's probably because of the significant cost, but I, I couldn't find any allocation relative to a new, new train sets. In other words, retiring that 1,000 series uh, and, and, and bringing in 7,000 or whatever the next iteration of, of that train set might be. Um, what, what are the plans and does this, uh, the work that was done last night by the uh, local regional delegation and, and Mr. Olver uh, on the Transportation Appropriations Committee of $150 million, does that change the dynamic here and what might, what might be we expect? Mr. Chairman, it most definitely does change the dynamic. And uh, we, we, as you know, uh, we, have, we have an RFP which we have received bids on for replacement of the 1,000 series cars as well as the expansion of new cars, uh, ex as, as well as new cars for the expansion to Dulles. And what we are awaiting is the dedicated funding. There's no okay. question about it. In if I may add, in terms of the $177 million redline rehab, that has been, it's gone through the committee, but it has not been approved by the board of directors. And in fact, our board is well aware of the, the fact that there may be additional demands that will take a higher priority than what has been set forth in that proposal. Okay. I still have uh, several minutes left. What I would like to do, and I'm going to have to take these answers on the record, uh, I would like to ask uh, each of you what you think the priorities for the next step. What has to happen next in terms of, of uh, whatever you think the top priorities should be, whether it's in response to this accident or infrastructure needs, uh, operational needs, uh, the, you know, the, grant, uh, the grant programs that uh, Mr. Rogoff was talking about earlier. And I'm going to I'm going to yield, and I'm going to allow uh, the the answers to go on the record. And I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton to take the chair and to continue with the process and use her allocation of time. But could we just use the next few minutes to go down the line and and list what the priorities should be? Thank you, Mr. Cato. Uh, Mr. Chair, since I'm next in order, yes, I will go. Um, the first response and use of monies will be to respond to the recommendations of um, the National Transportation Board regarding this accident. That is the first commitment this agency would make in, in spending its dollars. And any future recommendations um, concerning our system, uh, we need to have monies to respond to those. Um, in order of magnitude, the next response would be the replacement of the 1,000 series cars. Um, they are very old. Um, they need to be replaced, and as our chairman, um, Mr. Graham, has said, um, we've had the RFP and we're ready to go. All we need is just the funding to do that. Third, as I have mentioned many times, Metro has an urgent need of additional capital funds to maintain its infrastructure in the state of good repair, and that would be the third step. So first, safety from the requirements of this accident, any other safety needs. Um, the replacement of the 1,000 series cars, and continuous work on the aging infrastructure of the system. First, then I could. I could, either way. Um, Uh, 
Uh, let me let the others go first. Sorry, I turned it off. Um, as far as priorities uh, for our role in the FTA, I mean, I, I think our our highest priority right now is to get a reform plan developed under uh, Deputy Secretary Porcari and get, get that plan to Congress. We have a number of concerns as we look at the statutory authorities before us and, and the uh, in, inspection resources um, that um, Mr. Madison and the other SSOs do not have and, this, and the uh, authorities that we do not have within the FTA to mandate um, adequate resources. And we, that is the, what we're doing as it relates to developing uh, reform plans. As it relates to the, specifically the needs of WMATA, um, I think the most important thing is that we not prejudge the outcome of the investigation that uh, we keep our mind open in terms of what is the highest and most important capital need for those matching dollars that, that at least uh, as an interim step seem to be coming forward from Congress. Um, because, you know, rail cars, while important, are really our last line of defense in an accident. The most important thing we always must be focused on is, is, is avoiding the accident and the collision entirely, as, as Mr. Cato has been very articulate about. You're not going to develop a rail car that's going to leave passengers harmless if they're colliding at 59 miles an hour. Uh, so we really need to be focused on capital investments that avoid that, in, uh, that, um, that incident and similar incidents and uh, develop a capital plan around those safety assessments. Thanks. Mr. Madison. Uh, our first priority is to uh, continue working with WMATA and the NTSB on the investigation and to implement the recommendations that come out of the final report. Uh, our next uh, priority would be to work on improved legislation for the SSOs that give us greater authority, uh, more power to actually make some serious recommendations and to uh, have those rules be uh, taken seriously. And I guess our last, rec our last priority is uh, increased funding uh, that would also help with uh, continued training for SSOs and also for staffing. Ms. Hersman, did you have a, a, a list of priorities? Um, I would say the NTSB's first priority is get to the bottom of what's happened in this accident investigation, and then we can make appropriate recommendations to WMATA uh, and others uh, who may need to be the recipients of those recommendations. We've already begun that, uh, working with the others, uh, issuing recommendations, an urgent recommendation yesterday. With respect to the priorities uh, for WMATA, FTA, and others, uh, it's very encouraging to hear uh, their responses to the uh, question about what their priorities are. I think we would um, say from the safety board, our priorities would be for them to implement the safety recommendations that we've issued in the past. And uh, what I heard from many of the response, uh, responses here was that that was what they were going to be looking at doing. We have now 11 open recommendations to WMATA with the one we issued yesterday. Um, and some of those are in an open status. Uh, two of them are in an unacceptable status. Uh, we were very um, pleased with the quick response that we received from FTA and WMATA yesterday uh, when we issued our recommendation that they're beginning to work on it immediately. So uh, I think going forward, we'd like to see implementation of our recommendations. Thank you. Mr. Graham. Chair, may I add something about the probable cause issue? Because we are we are extraordinarily concerned about this, and we're we're very respectful of the NTSB's pronouncements and all of the work that they're doing. Some of which is central, some of which is peripheral. But let me make some some basic points here. On June 17th, this signal device, let me call it a device because it has various component parts, which has become the focus of suspicion about the probable cause of this accident. On June 17th, this device was replaced in the course of routine scheduled maintenance. There was no indication, to our knowledge, of any problem relating to the functioning of this device. On June 22nd, of course, we had this horrendous accident, and thereafter we went back. And what we did, and I believe NTSB was involved in this, we saw that there, a subsequent re review of this device functioning, there was this fluttering, so that at one point it was signaling the presence of a train, and at another point it wasn't, which was obviously a very substantial problem here. But what happened was we replaced the device. And this is a very important point, Madam Chair. We replaced the device. You'd think that that would remedy the issue. That, that with a new device, there might be some technical or other problem with the old device. 
that we would have, we would have solved the problem insofar as this particular situation. In fact, Madam Chair, the new device that was replaced continued the same fluttering as the former device. And so we're left, and, and I, I'm making this point, Madam Chair, very intentionally. I, with the Metro Board and the Metro Management has issued a, a statement on this. We're left with a very compelling mystery as to what is going on here. And we have to focus all of our energies in determining just what is wrong. And let me say there's another significance to this. And the other significance is that for those who are concerned about the slow movement of our trains and the fact that we're on manual operation, I think with this mystery outstanding, it's very important that we do just that until we figure out just what happened. This is a probable cause situation, we believe, where the answers and the solutions are not immediately apparent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Graham. Indeed, <laughs> that, that segues into to, um, one of my questions. M Mr. Cato uh, initially thought this was, I think to quote him, a freak occurrence uh, with the uh, uh, flickering in the track circuit. You indicate, Mr. Graham, that the flickering continues. Um, um, and I believe that you are now testing on a daily basis, uh, and I must ask you: Should this, or could this, was there, was there uh, any reason why more frequent testing was not done before? And I can sit here th today and look back and say: Was the testing that we did on a monthly basis um, sufficient? Um, you know, to go back in time and, and to make a conscious decision to look forward at the degree of testing, um, our testing for 30 years um, served us well. Uh, but something... Uh, is this a new device? A no, new device you, of a kind you've never used before? No, this is not a new device of a kind we've never used before. So you've, you've been running this device all along, and I, despite tests and changes, you've never seen the flickering before. I'm not aware of flickering um, as a result of this device. And when I say I have, I'm not aware, um, I've not personally found that in any of the records uh, of that occurring. The investigation is still in the way, and I think uh, we will continue to investigate, to review our records to determine if that's the case. Uh, but the question uh, has been we've changed our processes, but in the urgent recommendations from the NTSB yesterday, um, they thought that was a good first step, but we are required to do more. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, we are yeah. going to be doing more. And I repeat, this hearing is not about assigning cause. We don't have the slightest idea. Nobody could possibly do it. This hearing is being held because the public needs to know what you know now. Right. Uh, and we are very pleased that as the information develops that you have developed thus far, you are making that information public. Uh, and transparent. Uh, Mr. Cato, I, I'd, I'd like to ask about the recent decision to put the 1000 series trains in the middle uh, with, with presumably more crash-worthy crash -worthy trains at either end. First, did the union recommend that as I believe the union has uh, indicated? Um, and uh, has it been done elsewhere well, when you're answer, stuck with 30 percent of your fleet this way? Um, there's, let me answer the second part first because that's the easiest. I'm not aware of it being done elsewhere. Um, the cars are specifically placed um, based upon de some decisions mm -hmm. of crash worthiness. Did it occur to no one at WMATA, given the fact that you were stuck with these drains because Congress had not come forward with money, there was no other way to raise it? that perhaps that would have been uh, the better thing to do. And Ms. Herman, Herzman, uh, did you ever recommend that? Now, Ramada and myself, we were focused on making sure the crash, I mean, the crashes did not take place. Um, as mentioned before, at 59 miles per hour, um, you might have vehicles that will not uh, so-called telescope as much, but you're going to have severe damage. Our focus was keeping the system safe um, and to prevent accidents. 
Well, well Ms. Harris, when you're the expert, or at least the Transportation Board is national expert, you know these people could not replace those cars. And you have done your duty over and over again and said replace those cars. That message needed to come here. And, of course, it wasn't heard in time. Why did you not recommend? Well, it looks like a common sense <laughs> a recommendation that doesn't require a bunch of experts. Hey, at least don't make the crash uh, uh, occur in the front end or the back end, and that's where crashes are first felt. Take these 1,000 series cars and don't line them all up like sitting ducks the way they were on June 22nd. Why did you not recommend that? Ms. Norton, we recommended in, uh, after the Shady Grove accident in 96 that Metro l look at all of their fleet in, a, uh, in consultation with some er engineering experts to determine what needed to be done to improve the crashworthiness of their entire fleet, uh, whether it was retrofitting, making those cars more robust. But um, that's not my question, Ms. Herzman. These people are not the, the crash experts. And my question is very specific. Did it occur to anybody at NTSB? What I must tell you. <laughs> uh, was the first thing to occur to know nothing me. And I suspect to many people in the region because I was on WashingtonPost.com and for an hour right after the accident and somebody, you know, wrote in, well, why didn't they just put one, into, you know, one of the better cars at each end? I said, you have read my mind. I'll make sure I ask that question of Mr. Cato and the experts. My question is very simple. You knew these people did, could not possibly replace the trains. Over and over again, you said, do the impossible. Absent any way for them to possibly replace 30% of their fleet, didn't recommend that they take them out of service, why did the Transportation Board not at least recommend this rather, rather, um, <laughs> shall, I, shall I call it low-tech, low-cost low uh, low um, um, step um, that, that um, I mean, was there a technical reason why? Is it just so in your face that even the experts didn't see it? Well, I think the challenge here is because there are no standards and there is not crash testing done, that we don't have the engineering data to necessarily well, support the placement. Well, in that case, how, do, how can should they not do this or not, Ms. Ms. Harrisman? We don't know anything, according to the prior testimony, about crashworthy standards, thanks to the federal government. Uh, and Mr. Rogoff's agency, pardon me, before you came, but particularly because we have disallowed you. So, so I'm, I'm asking, is what they did the right thing to do, or now, in hindsight, would you say, well, that doesn't make a lot of difference? I think the safety board has not taken a position on whether or not uh, putting the cars in the center was the right thing to do. We did ask them to look at the evaluation of these cars in a scientific way. Ms. Ms. I must tell you, Ms. Herzman, uh, 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 the reason I find that action that, that, that falls short, even if we give Mr. Rogoff the kind of perhaps um, authority you ought to have, I can tell you without fear of contradiction. Leave aside the recession we're in. Let's suppose we're in that false boom economy we just come out where we made money. I can guarantee you that there is no transit system in the United States that isn't operating with old cars and cannot replace them quickly. Therefore, uh, in this hearing, we're really looking for answers. And it's real easy to say, uh, spend a billion dollars and you'll be safe. But I've got to ask you whether you are prepared, at least in the future, to look at interim possibilities when the only answer the NTSB has been able to come up with since 2004 is spend some money. The public needs to know, hey, short of spending money, do the experts have a response that can increase our feeling of safety when we get aboard the red line that, that, that we have no alternative but to board? Could you consider 
that in the event your recommendation costs a lot of money, and given what you know about resources, would you consider offering uh, recommendations temporary and short of spending the money that could increase safety? Ms. Norton, it is completely up to the recipients who are the experts in it managing their fleet to respond to us. It was up to the recipients to, to, to that's not Ms. Hurston, I'm not going to let you get away to, with that. To it was to up to the recipients to change the, no, that's just not fair. It was up to the recipients to buy new cars. You had no hesitation two or three times telling them when they rolled back, when they had the, when they rolled forward to change the cars. That you didn't mince your words on. We're dealing with millions of people who get on these trains, including people who visit the city. We're trying to learn whether or not there is any, anybody interested in doing what seems to us to be minimally necessary. If you do not have the money, what do the experts have to say to the system about interim steps. I think that is a fair question, and you either are prepared to look into that or not. And I want to know if you are prepared to look into interim steps such as Mr. Cato has now taken, such as the union apparently advised, uh, neither of which is presumed to have the background and expertise you do. Are you prepared to consider interim steps uh, when the funds are not available to do what you think is the best thing to do? Yes or no? Yes, and we often consider interim steps. If Wilmot had responded to That's all I need to know. To We're us. not trying to second guess anyone. We are trying to be forehanded. We're really not blaming anyone for anything. We think that this accident was so unforeseeable that our only duty here is to say, what little things can we do? To, to make sure this doesn't happen again. Frankly, I think that the victims and the public is entitled to hear of any interim step we can take, however minor, besides saying spend, spend a, gazillion, a, 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 a gazillion dollars, which everybody knows what well, Mata doesn't have and Ms. Hurstman, we don't have it either. Uh, I, I've got to ask um, you, Mr. Uh, Rogoff, um, the region met House and Senate members, and the first thing we thought of was, goodness, where are the feds? That's us, or you, more specifically. You say in your testimony that the FDA is prevented by law uh, from establishing safety standards, requiring inspections of the kind that are required on other common carriers, uh, uh, et cetera. What federal law prohibits you from acting? Uh, that specifically. And do you believe, don't even start to use the word reform the way you did in your testimony. What federal law prevents you from acting? And do you believe that at least that there is an obligation to at least on our part, you're talking to us now, I know you what you don't have. I want to know however where it's found. Uh, and, but do you believe there, that there is at least a minimal obligation on the part of federal authorities to adopt minimum standards that perhaps states and cities can go beyond, but minimum standards so that Ms. Herzman knows uh, minimally what is required uh, so that the operators know what the, would that not be a reasonable thing for the Congress to do? Well, uh, we certainly think so. I want to I answer both parts of your question. The language that has uh, been um, both litigated and found by the courts to be most, li most limiting to us is Section 5334B1 of, of Title 49, and I'm just going to read it because it's short enough except for purposes of national defense or in the event of a national or regional emergency, the secretary may not regulate the operation routes or schedules of public transportation systems. What's and the date on that, please? 
this has been in law really from the beginning of the Urban Mass Transportation Act um, going back um, a great many years. And What was the reason do, that, that you believe we prohibited I, ourselves I, I believe from, it, from, I, from providing for the safety of the public in rapid transit the way we do in other common carriers? The, the, I think it's twofold, um, Mrs. Norton. One, um, from the birthing of these agencies going back to the birthing of DOT in 1966, UMTA grew up as part of the um, urban renewal and, and urban redevelopment agenda um, in the Johnson administration, and it was thought to be a grant-making agency uh, and, and persisted as a grant-making agency. So should, it, should, should some other federal agency have been charged as more and more well, uh, as, as, a, more, as more and more cities and states develop mass transit systems? Well, I, I, you know, what, what is developed is sort of a hodgepodge system where we do have commuter rail operations under the Federal Railroad Administration with hundreds of federal inspectors across the country. So the problem was we, the, the, the transit systems weren't under the, the usual regulatory agency, the Federal Railroad Administration. We, we have those, the, those that are, are, are said to be off the system of the, off the National Railroad System, which is to say they're in a closed system. So you even got some operators that run both closed systems, like the MTA in New York runs the New York City subway. They also run the Long Island Railroad and Metro North. Long Island Railroad and Metro North are inspected by the FRA. The subway is not. And, and where, where Congress has... So, now, so there are... So, uh, how many, uh, so typically, there must be, be dozens of, of subway systems across the nation that Fort, just are, are by the seat of their own pants. Well, 48 systems to be exact in about um, 26, excuse me, 28 states. And, and they are largely, um, to the extent that they are regulated, uh, they are regulated by these state uh, organizations such as Mr. Madison speaks. And, and as you heard me say, and Mr. Madison say, Mr. Madison is concerned that party to, um, in their legal statute, and we don't have the ability to even set minimum standards for them. We could set minimum program requirements, but that gets into the issue of available funding. I mean, one of the great concerns that we're looking at as part of, um, you don't want me to use the reform, but part of our process as we look at this is, is the, the, the scant funding and the scant staffing of, of those organizations. Now, I'd like to use that just for a second to segue into an issue that Mr. Micah raised because it's a, a source of considerable confusion and concern. Mr. Micah is asking the question, well, FTA, why don't you let your grantees use their federal money to provide grants to the SSOs, the state safety organizations? Uh, our, our, our simple and first answer to that is that it's a conflict of interest that we don't think we should abide. We do not believe that we would ever want to have a situation where the grantee is using their funds, whether it's through a federal grant um, or other grants, to pay for the operating costs of their regulator. Now, that parallels what, what the Federal Railroad Administration is. Exactly. In fact, there used to be rail safety user fees that went into a fund. There wasn't a direct dollar pass relationship. And those fees were repealed by the Congress because they did not want um, the users to be paying the operating costs of their regulators and inspectors. And, and, and that is, this, you know, we just had a southwest flight land with a hole in it about the size of a football, about 12 by 18 last night. It lost compression. The FAA has dozens of inspectors that inspect nothing but southwest airline aircraft. We would never want southwest airlines to be paying the salaries of those inspectors and I don't think we should necessarily... So you don't think you're the people who ought to be regulating? No, no ma'am. I guess what I'm saying is we're not comfortable having our grantees use their monies to pay to for pay the inspectors. For. We think they should be paid for adequately, robustly, but by someone yeah. else. Again, as the money was in our court, I think this issue is in our court. I needed your testimony on, on, on the record, however, because if we want to really do something besides put up the money in the future... Uh, considering that what happened here could happen, you say, in 48 systems, we have an obligation now, mm -hmm. now that we know from, from this experience here. Mr. Madison, my staff uh, was charged with researching issues about this, uh, this crash, and, and they informed me that uh, they couldn't even find a website for the, your agency, the Transit State Oversight Committee that has the jurisdiction that 
such, it is, such as it is, and I understand how minimal it is that Mr. Rogoff does not have. Why is there such a lack even of, of public information letting the public know what it is you do? The uh, Tri-State Oversight Committee is- Speak, uh, speak, uh, speak into the- Sorry. Uh, our committee is um, formed up of members from each of the three jurisdictions. Um, in particular, in relation to the uh, question about the, the website, uh, we've had some discussion about that because we are let, we're not really sure who would maintain the website, what information we would have on there, because well, some of you, the, you would maintain it. Do you have any staff? No, I mean our staff. Like, if it would be how many which, staff do you have? Uh, we currently have eight staff members. So couldn't you just say you will maintain the website? Well, it would whoever it, you are. But the three, but the staff are in three different jurisdictions. So, and uh, we work out of different agencies. So we. we are I not, see. So you don't. You, you each works out of a, a specific. Okay. All right. You DC <laughs> will do it this year. You, Virginia, will do it next year. I mean, why is that so difficult to just have a website, at least, so people can understand what I will confess I did not even know existed. I didn't know we had a regional safety organization. Okay. Well, we weren't sure that if it was, if it was difficult or not. It was something that we hadn't considered in the Well, before. would you consider uh, putting up a website and assigning each jurisdiction a round of duty with respect to that? I understand you're sparsely funded. That goes back to the jurisdictions. Uh, Mr. Graham, I mean, you all, I know what you've done to, to had to go through just to, just to get the, uh, uh, the funds that are necessary in order for us to release the funds. So I won't say how come you haven't been pouring money on this board, particularly since uh, I can't believe we will seek to find out that there's any such board as this that is particularly well funded, given the lack of oversight from uh, the Transportation Administration. I'm sure that people decide to put their money uh, elsewhere. Um, uh, do you have regulations, Mr. Madison? Are they codified anywhere? Uh, yes. uh, what power do you have if you um, are the only agency that can look at safety? Uh, yes. Um, part C in Part 659, there is a stipulation that the State Safety Oversight Agency has to develop what's called a program standard, a list of program standards and procedures. Uh, the Tri-State Oversight Committee does have a document called the Program Standard and Procedures. And is that they, an enforceable document? Uh, no, really what it is, is it's a document that lays out how we execute our, how the talk is executed, but also. So you don't have any enforcement authority, is that right? You can't tell them to do anything. No, ma'am. We, no, well, we you, cannot. You, you did recommend. I can understand your frustration, but apparently um, you recommended that the FTA withhold 5% of federal grants when WMATA was non-compliant, although you know full well that WMATA didn't have any way to get the money. Wasn't that counterproductive um, to say, okay, take away their money uh, when they don't have any money? Uh, wouldn't it be better to... To, to, to make some other kind of recommendation? Uh, actually, the talk hasn't made a recommendation to withhold funding to WMATA uh, because we understand that if you a, can if, do that, is that we, you, we have, yeah, we can do that. A, and we, you have not done that? No, we have not. Because you recognize that if that's all they're giving you, they're not giving you any tools. If the, all they can give you is <laughs> to recommend that federal funds be withheld, they haven't given you anything to work with. I understand that, nor can the local agencies. Um, so as a practical matter, uh, the reason I haven't much heard and the public hasn't much heard of this, of, of your, your board, is not that you don't desire to do regulation, but you don't have any authority to do any regulation or to maintain the safety of the system or to enforce it, do you? No, we do not. Um, I have got to ask Mr. Cato to comment on this um, um, on this testimony about uh, sorry what we have read, indeed what we heard uh, here in the Congress uh, unrelated to this accident uh, about lease backs. Um, now, first, let me say that. Uh, particularly because this hearing isn't, isn't, isn't about uh, why didn't you do what you should have done. 
but about trying to explain why some things which may seem strange perhaps aren't, or certainly to give you the opportunity to explain them. But, uh, th and therefore I preface this question by saying you are operating with no way, you have been operating with no way to do capital costs and the only system with no dedicated funding. So somebody, some um, smart uh, financial person um, did what has been done all over the country, um, may indeed have gotten us in this fix. We have been working with you with the fix it got you in um, uh, to say take advantage of the fact that if you go to the banks to own the cars, they will have an incentive to buy the cars because unlike uh, you, Mr. Cato, you'll explain why, they can depreciate cars as they age because they can take the customary loss and write, write off taxes. So the notion occurs that the longer you keep the cars, from the point of view of the banks, uh, the better for, for them. Um, and um, this, this arrangement apparently goes uh, until 2014. And we are informed that if somehow these cars are retired before 2014, oh, this is a straight out money deal, this is not a safety deal, well, a desperate, a desperate uh, transit authority with no way to get the money. But correct me if I'm wrong on this, that if you retire these cars before 2014, that the system would have to pay a $250 million penalty. Now, we have a 2006 letter after the NTSB recommendation that Metro replace or these cars, where, where you say WMATA is constrained by tax advantage leases which require that WMATA keep the 1000 series cars in service at least until 2014. Were these cars in service for tax reasons because you were constrained by the way in which you had to finance the new cars? Or for that matter, what cars you had bought? Well, let me go a little bit into discussion. Um, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, transit agencies as well as other municipalities such as water districts were able to basically sell their equipment like rail cars and receive a, a, a sum of monies for doing that. They took some of the monies and invested those dollars into their systems. Uh, a portion of the monies they set aside to make payments, those lease payments back over the number of years that that agreement was in place. Um, that was an agreement that um, at the time was considered legal um, and it was encouraged in certain quarters. Since that time, that type of arrangement has been determined to not be legal. Yeah, I want that to be on the record. At the time you, went, you were engaged in this um, <laughs> uh, way to finance the cars, there was no indication from the IRS or federal authorities that this should not be done? No, no, there was no indication at that Indeed, time. the financial incentive was, in fact, to do this. It was a financial incentive for transit agencies and, again, other municipal operations, not just transit, um, to be able to do that. But to get to your question, and there's many pieces to that, of the 2006 letter in response to the NTSB recommendations on replacement of rail cars, um, while 2014 was the coverage date under the agreement that we had with various banks on the 1000 series cars, the agreement did allow substitutions. For an example, if we decided to sell the 1000, I mean to replace the 1000 series cars, we could use a newer car to substitute for the time period remaining under that agreement. So the, the letters sent in 2006 
had an error in it. So you weren't uh, constrained, though, from replacing the cars. But you could, you would not suffer a $250 million penalty? So long as we have a substitution, no. Now, did you have any substitution? Yes, we do have a substitution. So um, even though that's what the letters said at the time, um, since that period of time, Ramada has been in the process of replacing those vehicles, of identifying funding sources, as well as developing the specifications for a new series of um, rail vehicles, which several months ago we did put out the bid and we have received new bids on those vehicles. Um, if there was a way, um, if, if, um, if we could replace those cars today, I would replace them and substitute another car until the agreement that 2014 has arrived. Um, so yes, we could. We could substitute other vehicles. Mrs. Norton, could I just, <clears throat> I just think it's important to point out for people who may not be familiar with these transactions, this is not a transaction that's unique to WMATA. We've got We've got tra rail car operators um, across the country that during the same period that WMATA entered into these transactions did the same thing in order to leverage some additional dollars out of their rolling stock. I just want to clarify that lest anyone think that this is a Washington Metro unique arrangement. Uh, indeed. Thank you, Mr. Rogoff. In fact, we're aware that when <laughs> was it the Swiss bank that called the loan really taking full advantage of uh, the, the downturn in, of the economy, WMATA came here to, uh, along with virtually every yes. other transit system that was involved, which is every big transit system, to try to get some kind of relief from having to pay uh, essentially penalties um, uh, by having the loan called uh, so quickly. Uh, is that still a problem? Um, well, yes, again, let me go back what uh, happened. Um, these agreements had to be uh, insured by um, an insurance company. Just so happened that the majority of the agreements that we had were insured by AIG. And so when the economy Just took your a luck, dive. Mr. Cato. See? Just your luck. Um, yes, it's a uh, perfect storm, so to speak. Um, when their rating dropped, um, we were in technical default. This technical default because the agreements. Um, specify that the insurers had to have a certain rating. Well, AIG was not the only one whose ratings dropped. Every other insurance company in the world during this um, 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 bad economic times, their ratings dropped. And so we and every other transit agency, as well as municipalities and water districts, were in technical default of our agreements. Given that the banks could no longer write off a loss because an interpretation by the Internal Revenue Service that this um, transaction was not legal, they came after the various agencies demanding payment, even though we have made every lease payment required over the years. No missed payments. No missed payments whatsoever. And transit agencies and other municipalities were in danger of losing um, hundreds of millions, if not several billions of dollars and taxpayers' um, monies. We came to Congress and we also went to federal court um, to block um, the effort of that bank to do so. Um, we were successful um, to a certain degree in federal court and Congress has also been very supportive. Most of the, we're in the process now and we have unwind several of these agreements. And we have unwind those agreements for the monies that were set aside for the payments so no additional costs to the taxpayers. However, there are still multiple agreements um, here uh, in Ramada as well as across the United States that have not been unwind. And um, there is congressional um, action pending to um, deal with those issues. Thank you. I'm very sorry you had to go to court on this one. It was a terrible situation. Mr. Kafitz is back. Um, and I'm pleased to ask him if he has any questions. He's back in time to ask questions of this panel. Thank you. My apologies uh, for or being away for uh, during the votes. I, I appreciate your indulgence and your your understanding. And my apologies if I'm uh, hitting something that had been uh, uh, addressed uh, while we were away. Uh, Mr. Cato, you uh, there was a quote in there, a Metro statement that said, 
quote, we'll devote all of our resources, end quote, to developing additional protections. Can you give me some reassurances to we'll devote all of our resources and what that means specifically? Well, Ramada has limited capital resources, obviously. Um, our capital dollars are from federal 5307 funds, um, the local jurisdictions commit funds, and we have a capital budget. And there are dollars um, that we have identified for various programs we plan, we plan on doing this year, um, doing the budget year. And my comment was, if there is a recommendation that identifies um, a capital um, project or need within the agency to ensure the safety of our system for our customers and our employees, I will reprogram those dollars or recommend to the board and move to reprogram those dollars to so, so uh, fund that the, program. As you get the first tranche of dollars, where do, where do you anticipate spending that first set of dollars? If you had to prioritize maybe one, two, or even three, what, what, what's at the top of your list? Um, safety. And for, Can you be more specific than that? Um, implementing the recommendations um, outlined by the National Transportation Safety Board. That's the number now, one. Now, my understanding from Ms. Herzman's, and correct me if I'm wrong in my, from what I heard, there have been 76 recommendations along the way. Mm -hmm. How many of those have or have not been implemented? That is not just from this incident, but from past incidents. If I recall, reviews. there are two different, um, I, I, this is off the top of my mind. Sure. Um, there are eight recommendations that have not been implemented. Two from an investigation in 1996, and I believe six from an investigation or report um, in 2006. Um, uh, so my numbers might be slightly off, but I believe there's eight out of the 70 um, some odd recommendations. Ms. Hersman, is that your understanding? Um. Over the, uh, over the seven investigations, uh, we've issued 76, and actually with our RECs yesterday, 77. And of those metro, uh, we have closed the vast majority of those. So there are only 10 of those that remain in an open status now. Um, eight of them, metro is continuing to work, uh, you know, to address the concerns that we've raised. They um, address operating issues, track issues, equipment issues, um, and... Uh, Two of them are classified in an unacceptable status, and they deal with um, specific I, I track issues. For, yeah, it, sorry to interrupt you with our mm -hmm. limited time. It, just for the clarification of staff and myself and whatnot, could we get some sort of summary as to which ones have not been implemented, maybe some degree of uh, uh, justification as to why they were not? Um, let me move on in the, in the essence of time here. Time short. Uh, Mr. Cato. Um, do you, would you encourage writers to record and report negligent behavior? I mean, we've had a couple of those reports in the last couple of weeks. What, what would you say to writers? And would you encourage that, not encourage that? What should they do or not do? I haven't encouraged that since the day I walked in the door. Um, I would encourage any of uh, our employees, our customers, anyone to see um, an operation that they um, feel is unsafe or that would hinder the operation of this organization to report that. And how would you assess the morale, and what are we going to do to help those that are, they are working hard and diligent, and they, are, they do a good job, but, uh, but uh, obviously our, the morale maybe suffers. How would you assess that, and what can we do? Well, any time you have an event in an organization um, such as occurred on um, June 22nd, the morale is low. But I can share, share with you also that employees that I have discussed or had a discussion with concerning the videos that most of us have seen on TV or uh, YouTube are angry, are angry at those uh, workers because the overwhelming majority of our employees do an outstanding job of providing customer service. And that all it takes is one or two or three to ruin the image and the reputation of the entire um, agency. So morale, of course, is impacted by what occurred, but also there is an anger um, of those individuals, those few individuals who obviously are not following our safety um, procedures and policies. Uh, and, and finally, let me just ask you, you know, I, well, one of the, the, the general concerns is the idea of implementing best, best practices and to the degree in which you're communicating maybe with counterparts and others to implement those best practices and understand what's working and not working. My, my time is up, but could you maybe address that and what you're doing and not doing in that regard and how we could perhaps improve that? 
Um, that's, if, if I understand the, the general overall question, was the implementation of best practices. Mm -hmm. And um, we do. We have a, a safety, um, chief safety officer who looks at best safety practice. Our operations staff look at best operations practice is defined by the industry. Yourself? Excuse me? How would you grade yourself on that? Um, I grade ourselves high. I mean, I, I've not thought about an A or a B uh, in, in that regard. But again, I want to clarify the definition of best, safety, uh, best practices. Um, one organization might say their practices are best. I might not agree. And therefore, I would not implement those. But as um, best practices that have been certified through a process, um, we all uh, move forward and we work towards implementing all of those if they apply to our type of operation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the gentleman. I, I want to thank uh, Ms. Holmes Norton for pinch hitting for me again. Uh, I understand that the Rules Committee is still meeting, so that means Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Uh, Connolly are both uh, in the Rules Committee. Um, however, I, I wanted to go up on one question. Uh, on, on the 17th, when the, the I think it was a bond, they called it, uh, in the circuit that was malfunctioning, uh, was replaced, uh, what was done right after that, uh, Mr. Cato, in terms of making sure that it was functioning properly? Is there a, you know, testing protocol that has to be implemented? Uh, because it seemed to be at the heart of the problem. Yes, yeah, so, um, the, the repair work, not repair work, the replacement um, was done on this circuit on, on, on June 17th. And at that time, it was tested to ensure that it was working properly. Our records indicate that it was working properly uh, at that time, it's the records I have seen. Um, again, monthly, we were running this test to determine um, whether or not there were problems with any of the circuits in the system. After the accident, post-accident, we did run that test and it demonstrated and it showed that this particular circuit was fluttering I mean, um, over a period of time up to the accident itself and post-accident. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering what happened immediately after you repaired the system uh, on the 17th. That, I guess... We did... I'm sorry. No, that, that's basically it. I, I know you, you, you say your, your systems indicate that it was acting uh, properly. What do you do to determine that? Do you run a bunch of test trains or tell me about that? No, we do not run a bunch of test trains to determine if that particular circuit is running because we have 3,000 circuits in the system. And we were going through a, um, a program to replace all of those circuits. The individual circuit is tested. Um, and again, monthly we test the whole system. But not just replacing that circuit, but other circuits on, on, on that line. And we did a site test on the circuit to make sure it was receiving the signals and connected properly. And, how, and where is that operated from? Is that a manual test at the, at the junction or is it back in the uh, operations room? I believe it's a manual test at the um, site, but I'm turning around to look at my rel expert to sure. see sure. I, I was correct. It's a manual fills um, test on site. Okay. My concern, and, and maybe Ms. Herzman, you can talk about this as well, the more reliant we become on technology, uh, I think the more important it is that we make sure that, te that the technology is, is operating because in this instance, uh, there was little indication, I guess, um, of a malfunctioning circuit that had very grave circumstances for a lot of people here, a lot of families. And, uh, you know, I, this technology, we're becoming more uh, no fallback or uh, fail-safe measures by which we can determine whether these things are, are still operating. And... Uh, you know, you got trains with loaded with people, uh, you know, packed in there, operating at high speeds, and we we can't have this level of uh, you know malfunctioning, I guess, going on. And uh, we just have to be more vigilant about testing 
these safety systems to make sure they're working. You, we, we see the consequences of this today, but in retrospect, I'm, you know, I'm probably a little surprised we don't have these things more often. Uh, maybe we, um, I think we just take a lot for granted. And if we're going to rely on these systems to replace operator uh, uh, ability to override the system when it becomes necessary, then we have to make sure these systems, you know, work. Um, Ms. Herzman, I mean, are you seeing a lot more of this in other systems as well? And uh, does the NTSB have recommendations regarding the uh, the routine or the uh, the regular scheduling of these inspections? I think the question you're asking has a lot of answers to it. And so um, uh, one of the things that I want to make sure that we cover is um, Chairman Graham talked about what happened, you know, after uh, we identified that there were some problems. We've been changing out components. Uh, that particular impedance bond that was replaced, uh, we looked at it with a shunt on the track. We looked at it with an exemplar train on the track. We replaced it with a brand new impedance bond. We replaced it with the old impedance bond that was in before. There are still inter intermittent failures. Sometimes it's working. Sometimes it's not even with those changes. We've walked back, uh, you know, the cable to see if there might be some cabling issues. There are a lot of challenges here, and we're tr changing out some components and trying to identify what the problem is. That's why the work is still ongoing. But with respect to the redundancy, I think that's what you're raising, uh, you know, a vital system that everyone's relying on to perform. I think that's what our recommendation yesterday was about, is to have a monitoring system so that you know when something fails. You've got to get an alert when something fails. If people are relying on that system to be vital and 100% of the time it's got to be accurate, you've got to know when there's a malfunction or a loss of detection. They can do that now by looking back at their data. What we want it is for there to be a real-time notification when that happens that there's an alert. So we've seen this on the pipeline side or on the aviation side. So for example, if you're monitoring a pipeline, you see a loss of pressure, the person who's monitoring that pipeline gets an immediate alert that's aggressive, that it grabs their attention so they can start shutting that pipeline down if they're having a leak. Air traffic control. If they have aircraft that are coming too close to the ground, they get a low altitude alert on their scopes. Those air traffic controllers are compelled then to tell the pilot, you need to pull up, you know, you're getting low, there's terrain there. What we want to make sure is when the system itself isn't functioning the way it was intended, that there's some way to get notification no. about that so that, that, that you can intervene. Okay. Mr. Lynch, can I just sure. speak to one element about it? It doesn't have to do with the, 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 the specific elements of, of the technology here, but it's a really a more macro observation. You know, earlier uh, Mr. Davis talked about and identified $6 billion in deferred maintenance uh, on, on the WMATA system. Nationally, we just completed a study for just the seven largest rail transit operators, including the T in Boston, which indicates we have a $50 billion deferred maintenance backlog. That's just the seven largest systems. We're updating that study to even incorporate a larger universe of systems. But this is really a more macro issue for reauthorization because one of the things, obviously, we, we see in these studies, uh, Metro Rail is a comparatively young system. But the red line is the oldest segment. It's 33 years old. The, even the newer systems are starting to age. And, and it, it makes the need to, to face the deferred maintenance issue sort of head on because, um, you know, as we could say generically, not in the context of this particular accident or any other one, but deferred maintenance issues, if deferred long enough, become safety issues. And, and that's an issue that the administration and the Congress is going to have to take on more broadly. Thank you. Chair recognizes? We could. We could. Um, what I would like to do is just give, you know, I'm sure we didn't exhaust the full menu of questions to all of you uh, today. But uh, what I would like to do is just to give, if, if there are some uh, issues that you'd wish to amplify or, or hit on that, um, members of the panel here have not asked, uh, I'd like to, to hear those. Um, and as well as I had said earlier with the earlier panel, uh, there are other members here, uh, Mr. Conley, uh, I know Mr. Van Hollen, uh, Mr. Cummings, the gentleman from, from Maryland, 
they and, and as well as some of the uh, uh, Mr. Bill Bray and uh, Mr. Issa may want to submit some questions in writing and so we would ask that you uh, diligently respond to those questions if possible um, but I'd like to give you at least a couple of minutes each uh, in closing to, to hit on the areas that you think are the most, port, most important going forward uh, for this system to operate in a reliable and safe manner uh, the way we all would, would like it to. Uh, Mr. Graham, you recognize for two minutes. I would say just very briefly, Mr. Chairman, that, that you know, and maybe this demonstrates my keen sense of the obvious, but we need to have the probable cause of this accident identified. And we need to have a preliminary report from the NTSB. If, if it doesn't pinpoint the, the, the precise cause of the accident, it should at least describe what, what the challenges are that we're facing. Because our experience, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that there's a great deal of half information, misinformation, misleading information, which is, uh, you know, uh, in circulation at the present time. And we would really appreciate from the NTSB, and this is why I, I took uh, uh, Delegate Norton's time a little bit, to try to focus the issue, because if, if we could just get the public to understand just what it is that we're wrestling with at this point, I think that would go a long way in reassuring the public that we want to have manual operation, we want 35 speed, mile an hour speed limits on the red line, and, and it would also better focus the discussion of what we're dealing with. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cato. I believe many of the speakers today really, um, from a broad perspective, talked about the issues. Um, as we look at public transportation now and into the future, there must be a balance, a balance of system expansion, but with that expansion and assurance that monies are there to maintain the system. Um, when we look at all capital programs, we can't just look on the side of what are we going to get new and what type of celebration we're going to have because of a new line. But we must also plan for the maintenance of that line for the next decades into the future. And this is a discussion that's going on within the industry today, of uh, the state of good repair of the, um, of the organizations and the systems. And it is something that we must focus on. And finally, in talking about the aspect of oversight, and uh, this might not win me some friends in some places. Um, oversight sometimes um, might be difficult because it takes time. But if oversight is focused on the safety of a system um, to ensure the safety of our customers, then I welcome that. And also to provide the necessary authority on the part of the um, agencies to have that responsibility to take action. Ms. Herzman. I've heard many of the concerns that were uh, raised here today um, uh, by Congresswoman Norton, uh, Chairman Graham. I will definitely uh, take those back uh, and take them to heart. Um, we make many recommendations uh, based on what we think is best. Um, we don't have to consider cost-benefit analysis when we make our recommendations. And today uh, we held a board meeting uh, determining the probable cause of a accident that occurred up in the Green Line uh, uh, in Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, we had a fatal operator uh, that was killed uh, up there last year. We made a recommendation uh, in that uh, board meeting this morning for um, the Federal Transit Administration and for MBTA to look at putting positive train control on that line. We understand that that's a cost constraint for them. Uh, the green line is the only line uh, that doesn't have a form of positive train control on it. We know it's their oldest line up there too, uh, and that will be a significant cost to them, but we do believe uh, that that's what's needed to save lives. Um, so we do make recommendations, Ms. Norton, and we don't, we don't have to pay for them. And so I do recognize the frustration. Uh, but our charge is not to do that part of it. Our charge is to recommend what we think is in the best interest for the safety community. We're the conscience and the compass of the transportation industry, and they get to decide if or how they implement it. Um, with respect to... Uh, Chairman Graham's concerns, we do have a number of rail investigations that are pending, about 16. Uh, we will work very hard to get the cause of this uh, 
determined. We have another MBTA wreck uh, or another MBTA accident. I was up on Mother's Day uh, for another Green Line accident, and so we have many in the queue. But even if we don't complete a final report on the Metro accident, we will do as we did yesterday when we identify safety issues that are acute in nature. We will issue recommendations to address you know, whatever improvements we think need to take place. And so uh, we recognize everyone would like us to determine the probable cause of the accident yesterday. We'll work to do it as quickly as we can, but in the meantime, we'll put out recommendations to address the issues we think we need to look at. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rogoff. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Lynch. I mean, I'll certainly echo what Mr. Cato said about the state of good repair. Ironically enough, both the FTA and WMATA had a scheduled uh, roundtable for the whole nation on, uh, for transit operators on the state of good repair, which was planned several months before the accident, and we, we hosted it together just, uh, just last week. Uh, I, I wanna, I'm glad uh, Member Herzman raised the issue of the Back Bay recommendation because it's very telling on this whole issue about whether we need to reform the, the legal authorities as it relates to safety enforcement. Her recommendation, or I should say the board's recommendation to the FTA is to facilitate the installation of positive train control. The reason why it says facilitate is because we are not allowed by law to mandate it. At the very same time, the Federal Railroad Administration is moving a regulation to mandate positive train control on the rail operators on the systems that they inspect and they have the legal authority over. So it really brings to a head the, the, the legal issues we're raising here. Now, we've talked a lot here about the FTA model versus the FRA model, and I, I want to emphasize there are other models out there that may be appropriate for a, a reformed Federal Transit Administration. Within the Federal Motor Carrier System, um, the Motor Carrier Safety Administration, within uh, Pipeline Safety, we provide federal funds to state enforcement agents so they would be adequately resourced to not only enforce state regulation but also federal regulation. So, you know, we recognize the need to take a, a hard and fresh look at, at, these author, uh, at these legal authorities, but we don't want to just run out and say we need to federalize this right away we will be back to Congress in a few weeks with a reform plan that tries to capture the best model for this particular industry that works with our state partners as, as best we can. Thank you. That's good. Thank you, Mr. Rogoff. Mr. Madison. Thank you, Mr. Sh Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would just reiterate um, from the SSO standpoint the need for funding and, and legislation that actually gives the SSO some authority. Um, there are currently 27 SSOs throughout the country, and um, I mean, I've met most of them, and they're really good people, and we don't want to imply by anything that's been said today that, there, that the lack of authority doesn't mean that there is, isn't a lack of effort on the part of the people who work in the SSOs. Um, they work very hard with the resources that they have, and um, we try to make our systems as safe as possible. Thank you. Uh, we want to thank you for your willingness to come before this committee and offer, it, offer your testimony to help us. Uh, just in closing, you know, uh, we, ha we all have a special responsibility here. Running a, a public transit authority is a very serious uh, responsibility. We had, uh, you know, we had nine, nine people who went out to work one morning, like, like we all do every day, got on the metro and, and uh, you know, put their trust in the system probably not giving it a second thought because of the level of trust that was built up in that system over, year, over the years. And uh, because of failure in the system, uh, members of the public were, were killed. Those families are dealing with those consequences, and, and there were dozens of, of uh, uh, riders that were, were hurt that day and still have not recovered. Those are very serious consequences when we don't run a system as well as we should. And so, you know, I, I, I think that everyone's heart and mind is in the right place on this and what we need to do. But it, it, it is a serious business, and hopefully with the injection of resources brought in uh, by Ms. Norton and, and uh, by Mr. Conley and Van Hollen and Mr. Hoyer and Mr. Cummings uh, and others, uh, some of those needs will be met, but it will require our diligence to make sure that that money is spent properly and that our priorities are what they should be. And, you know, we thank you all for your, the role in this that you play in making it uh, safer for the riding public. And, uh, 
you know, we just, we just we'll just continue to work with you as we move forward and trying to improve the, the system for everyone. Thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony today, and uh, we bid you a good day.